far with the president and I'm so excited. Once we were, I think at least I was in 2004, perhaps Dr. Vote harassed a bunch of us to come to the HPVA, this new meeting, kind of newish meeting to us. And we were all the way in the back or on the sides or I'm being extremely shy. And someday you will still feel um, shy and new and still actually be asked to introduce one of your very august friends. So Dr. Christina Ferroni is somebody who I have known since she showed up at Mass General Hospital as an intern a few years back. And I actually, I call her Dr. Ferroni, not just out of respect, because I actually had no idea what her first name was for the first year, three years that we knew each other. It was just constantly Ferroni, Ferroni. And, and it was, whether it was taking care of a patient, doing an incredibly great operation, actually understanding basic science and um, just being a great skier and all those kinds of things. It was always Ferroni. So I only realized she was Christina when she went into the lab and started publishing papers. And I, I knew what her first two initials were. But Dr. Ferroni is a work of nature. She has uh, a polyglot background and is equally fluent in English as she is in uh, Italian and in German. She has amazing, brilliant parents, a mama and papa that have I've, I've been had the pleasure of meeting and know everything about uh, science, family, and the world, and is just has been somebody I've, I've really looked up to. Even though she's a little younger than me, I've looked up to since since I've met her. She understands science. She understands surgery. She will get it done. She's just a get it done kind of person. And she, I've watched her career with with great um, just sort of envy, honestly, as she's tr successfully tr uh, tr you know straddled the worlds of basic science at the highest levels of clinical trials uh, and of doing exquisite patient care. So I'm so proud that she is the new chair of surgery at Cedar sinai And I just can't wait to hear what she has to tell us about uh, management or basically optimizing successful resection of, of, of borderline um, locally advanced pancreatic cancer. So. Thank you, Jenny, for that really generous introduction. Jenny was my senior resident, so she saw all the mistakes that I made as a junior resident when I was an intern in 1997. Um, but it is a great honor to be here. And hopefully I will not be giving you answers, but rather leave you with more questions about how exciting the world of pancreatic cancer has become and how many things we still have left to do. And I think locally advanced disease is really the area where we as surgeons will have a huge impact. And it's the area in pancreatic cancer that I think is evolving much faster than the other areas. So I thought I'd start off with a few things that we can all agree on, because um, I figure I'm gonna get to the ones where we don't agree later on. So, I mean, the three reasons we usually offer patients any kind of therapy is right to, for a potential cure, and or to help them live longer and or to help them feel better, right? And so for pancreatic cancer, that's a pretty tall order for these patients. And I think we all agree that multimodality therapy is gonna be the answer to pancreatic cancer, right? Not one treatment is gonna be the silver bullet that's gonna be able to give us the cure. So, you know, we just had a great lecture by George and to just sort of build on that. I mean, we've learned over the last 10 years that this is not one cancer, right? This is a very heterogeneous cancer. And it's not only amongst the different cancers that it's heterogeneous, but it's even within the tumor that there are there's significant intratumoral heterogeneity, right? And that heterogeneity is then also affected by treatment. And so this is some of the work that we published a few years ago where you can really see that when you treat a tumor with chemotherapy, it evolves, right? It changes. And so in these experiments, it's really about fulfirinox and how the epithelial phenotype pushes itself into the mesenchymal phenotype. And the mesenchymal phenotype tends to be the more aggressive metastatic phenotype. And so all of these things are still out there that we need to figure out. And so the management of the metastatic disease and the local disease is really the big challenge for all of us. And some might say that these are interchangeable. All pan the nihilists would say that all pancreatic cancer is metastatic, right? Whether we think so or not. And I guess I would just argue that when I show you this phase two locally advanced fraud that you all already have seen and know, the only reason that I'm showing you this is to talk about the outcomes, right? And these are locally advanced patients that were um, 
categorized based on our multidisciplinary clinic. They received eight cycles of fulfirinox, 50.4 gray of radiation, and 34 of them out of the 48 ended up going to the operating room with uh, 30 having an R0 resection. And so the survival curves look better, right? They look better than the standard locally advanced disease that tended to die within 11 months. But you see that the curves are still very similar. The slope is very similar. It's just pushed to the right. And whether you look at the retrospective data or the clinical trial data, it's the same, right? The majority of patients present with metastatic disease as their first site of recurrence. And I think that's really important for us to remember as we think about what we are doing in the local setting and trying to improve the overall survival since most of the patients will succumb from the metastatic disease rather than the local disease. And so now begins the controversy. And I'm hoping that this generates a lot of questions and thoughts and clinical trial ideas as we go through some of this data. But, you know, we've tended to rely on the clinical trials in metastatic disease. And is that the right systemic therapy for the patients with locally advanced disease, with resectable disease? I did just tell you that most of them present with metastatic disease. So we assume that that is correct. But I also showed you data that the chemotherapy is going to alter how the tumor behaves. So that we have to also keep in mind. And now that Napoli 3 is out, are we all going to change? Are we going to all use liposomal irinotecan? Are we going to move away from modified fulfirinox and gemabraxane? Right? It's all these things as we think about how are we going to manage our patients and what are we going to use as our gold standard to really affect the systemic disease, right? And so when we talk about does the tumor change over time, and I showed you the experiments that we published a few years ago, when you look at the German phase two neolap study, they did exactly that. They used locally advanced and borderline resectable patients, and they switched. They either got gemnepaclitaxel or they got gemnepaclitaxel and then fulfirinox. And while the resection rate wasn't different and the overall survival rate wasn't different, the histologic response was significantly different, right? And I'm, we're looking forward, and we give uh, Flavio Roca a lot of credit for the OHSU trial, where they're doing exactly that on a larger scale, and we look forward to those results to see how we're affecting the tumor microenvironment and what that does for resection for us. And then what about the germline mutations? I mean, after George's talk, I, I, I've only put two slides in here, which clearly does not, you know, even closely come to what, what George told us all about. Um, and so going behind him is always hard because he's so smart and so good. But when you look at the phase three polo trial, what do we do with this in the locally advanced setting? Right? I mean, we know that our patients, we have BRCA mutations. Do we give it neoadjuvantly? Do we give it adjuvantly? Do we not resect them at all and just keep them on a PARP inhibitor, right? So it's this question of all this data from the metastatic setting, what do we do with it in the locally advanced setting? And how do we optimize things for our patients so that we can get them to resection? I just put this in here just because of the KRAS targeted treatments, right? And we know that there's now FDA approval um, for a KRAS targeted therapy it was mainly in lung cancer, but pancreas got pushed in there as well. And Eileen O'Reilly is running a great trial at Sloan Kettering where they're looking at intratumoral injection of um, a KRAS, a polymeric uh, KRAS inhibitor, right? So we take that data, right? So in the locally advanced setting, should we do more targeted treatment? Should we stay with systemic treatment? How much can we combine the systemic and the local treatment? And I think all of that is really, really important as we think about how we want to design the next trials for our patients. I put up this Stand Up to Cancer trial because it was just presented at GI ASCO and many of the people in the audience contributed from the different centers. And what you can see here is a forearm study with a full Fulfirinox backbone, but it you know, addressed a few questions, including anti-PD-1, right? So nivolumab anti-PD-1 and what is the role of you know, immune modulation in pancreatic cancer. 
And unfortunately, you know, there was no statistical difference in the R0 resection rates between the arms and no <clears throat> statistical difference in recurrence. And here you can see specifically, because it was borderline and locally advanced, this is specifically the locally advanced patients. But pretty much on all measures, all four arms are exactly the same. So a ton of work, right? And yet we did not get much of an answer out of this clinical trial, which just sort of shows to you the frustrations that come with clinical trials, but it's very, very rewarding because now we can do the science and better understand what we should have done differently as this trial was designed. So I think the metastatic setting is, has provided us with a huge platform and a lot of opportunity for our locally advanced patients and how we're going to better manage them, right? I think yesterday's discussion, we talked about, you know, for most patients, about 10 to 20% have micrometastatic disease that you find at the time of the operation, even with modern imaging. And I know that um, Mark and the Mayo Clinic is going to um, published their uh, last 1,000 patients, just reconfirming that again. So we have a lot of work to do on that side in that front as well. But now it comes to local disease management, right? Like we, the surgeons, we care about local disease management, but we can really only do that if we manage the metastatic disease. And so this continuum of locally advanced has moved more than probably any other definition, right? What is considered resectable now versus five or 10 years ago, I think is very different. And I think it also differs significantly from institution to institution. And so here's the standard definition that you all know about. And I give Susan Tsai a lot of credit because she started to think about you know, should we define locally advanced disease differently? Do we need to be more specific and not have such a general bucket? Because they aren't all the same, right? And what is resectable and not resectable is not the same. And so now the question comes, well, with local modalities, we have surgical resection, we have radiation, we have IRE, right? And, and how do we know what to use. And yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about different kinds of radiation, right? We can't even agree on the different kinds of radiation that might be helpful in the locally advanced setting, whether that is to control the local tumor growth or to be able to get downstage the patient so that we can take them to the OR and get the tumor out. And so, you know, whether it's external beam, the standard 50.4 gray or SBRT, protons or intraoperative radiation therapy, right? The physics of it is very different. The doses are very different. The tolerability is different and the cost is very different. And so we haven't even gotten that quite figured out. And we have a lot of work to do on that front. Now for ablative radiation, Chris Crane at Sloan Kettering is really leading this charge. And he's giving, you know, 63 to 75 gray of radiation to the tumor with a focus on the hypoxic center of the tumor. And, you know, I compliment Alice Way and the group because they are now beginning a 60 patient single institution trial looking at the role in borderline and locally advanced patients of chemotherapy followed by ablative radiation. And you can see what their primary endpoints are. But I think they're doing exactly the right way, right? Because we have to study it in a way that we can really make some conclusions from the results. And of course, there's always problems with single center uh, studies. And what about IORT? It's an MGH favorite, right? And this is data from when Dr. Warshaw was still the chair and 5FU was the standard chemotherapy, which we know doesn't do much for the systemic disease. But the reason that I put up this slide is to highlight that there is a subset of patients that even though you left their tumor in and you gave them inadequate systemic therapy, a large dose of radiation controlled their disease and they had long-term survival. It's a very, very small proportion of patients, but clearly there is a phenotype that is much more radiosensitive than others. And when we look at intraoperative radiation therapy in the era of neoadjuvant, it can potentially mitigate a microscopic positive margin as we go for these more aggressive resections. 
But to be able to study it, you know, we do feel a responsibility, right? Because a lot of the data has come out of just MGH and it's a single center study and that has a lot of, you know, pros and cons, obviously. But with the PACER study, and there are about seven institutions enrolled right now, and it'll uh, accrue about 200 patients. I think we'll learn a lot more about the applicability of intraoperative radiation therapy at different institutions and its potential effect on patients' overall survival and local disease control. What about IRE? So we, um, or I have not tended to do IRE. Um, it is a modality that I think is very user dependent, but I do commend them, right? In the lo for locally advanced tumors, they've set up a prospective phase three randomized trial to look at the outcomes, whether you do the IRE open or percutaneously. And I think that this will just be one other modality that we can think about, but I give them a lot of credit for doing this in the clinical trial setting rather than just retrospective series. All right, now comes you know the, the, the big discussion. And I actually put very few slides for this because I think that this is very institution dependent. And Mark Trudy's here and I respect him so much and he's a phenomenal surgeon, right? And Yesterday, when we had our debate, we were talking about it really is in the hands of the surgeon what people are comfortable with, but there is also a component of what should we be doing and what should we not be doing, right? Um, and just because we can, we, don't, we shouldn't always do it. So when we talk about divestment, uh, this is Jin He's slide. And I thought his, this was really great because it really puts everybody on the same page in terms of what the de definitions are of skeletonization versus divestment, right? And it, for the divestment, it's really getting into between the vessel wall and the tumor and or the neurolymphatic tissue, right? So this is a deeper or closer resection and it does have its perils, right? As you know, uh, I commented yesterday, sometimes you're, you're doing a divestment and then you see the inside of the lumen of the artery, which was not the intent of your divestment, right? And that changes the scope of your operation. But when we look at the retrospective data at MGH, right? Because there is no prospective data about divestment, right? You can see, and this is really comparing the upfront resectable patients to our retrospective patients who received neoadjuvant therapy. So this is borderline and locally advanced disease. And you can see, I mean, the reason I put up this slide is really so that you can see that the morbidity was not significantly higher with divestment, right? And the mortality wasn't significantly higher. And we still reached a good R0 resection rate. Because I think, you know, there are times when you do worry, are you really doing an oncologic operation when you're not removing all of the vessels on block with the tumor. But I do think that with this is an acceptable R0 resection rate. And when you look at the morbidity and mortality, they are fairly low. You know, and, and this role of when we do arterial divestment and how much divestment we should do before we convert to an arterial resection and in what patients we should do this in, I think is on us. We as surgeons have a responsibility as a group, as we gain more experience to define this really well, right? I think everyone trying to figure it out on their own is probably not the right approach for our patients. But now that we know, and you know, many institutions have a few hundred cases, we can say, let's go back and look who are the patients who didn't do well? Who are the patients who had an R1 resection or even an R2 resection? Who are the patients who died? And when we look at those complications in a really a peer reviewed way, in an academic way, I think we'll be able to come up with some very good guidelines for all of us to follow. Now I put up um, Mark's arterial resection paper. I know they have another one coming out very soon. Um, and this will update the morbidity and mortality and their outcomes, right? But arterial resections are big, big operations, right? And they do carry more risk than the divestment in general, right? When you're talking about mortalities that go from about 2% to 6 to 7%, and that is significantly more. 
but I thought that the conclusion um, of, of uh, in, in the uh, manuscript was really, really important. And this goes for all of us, right? The three factors that independently associated with outcome were biology, biology, and biology. However you wanna define biology, no matter what technical exercise that we do, right? And so this is really upon us and that's why I wanted to start with a talk about systemic disease and metastatic disease. What are we doing to control that before we become much more aggressive at the local level? And so in conclusion, you know, I think we can all agree pancreas cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. And we're learning much, much more about the mutations and the biology of it. We still have a lot to learn about how our therapies change the microenvironment of the tumor. And the, and the way that the tumor behaves. So multimodality systemic therapy is going to be the key to helping our patients live longer. And it is going to be the key in locally advanced pancreatic cancer so that we can optimize the patient's outcome. Now, the best modality for local control, I think, is still up for discussion. I think a lot of it is institution dependent and experience dependent. But I do think we as a community, especially at the AHPBA, where everyone in this room has so much experience that we do owe it to our patients to really look at our results very vigorously to be able to come up with guidelines uh, to better serve our patients. And I think that, you know, as the systemic treatment gets better and better, the local management will be more and more important. And so I hope that I've left you with many questions, especially the young people in the audience. There are a lot of great clinical trials that need to be done. Um, and it really is very, very rewarding to do these clinical trials. Even if the clinical trial turns out negative, you always learn a lot. So I thank you very much. We have time for questions for Dr. Ferroni. Oh, good. Mark's coming. That's <laughs> Thank you, Christina, for a great talk. Uh, regarding the last line in your last slide, surgeons should lead clinical trials in locally advanced disease. Uh, the problem when I see some of these trials uh, being put together, they use resection as an outcome. Is that appropriate? Because a patient seeing one surgeon may get an operation, a patient seeing another may not, strictly because of their comfort doing a certain procedure. There are cemeteries full of people with successful surgery. Should it be using another outcome other than resection? And what would that be in your opinion for the future? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, no, I think that's an incredibly important question because you're exactly right. I think that what people are comfortable with doing and the arterial resections that you do relative to other surgeons is very, very different. I think that it is a easy, fast outcome. So you can read out your trial faster and try to get an indication of its efficacy. I think probably, you know, progression-free survival or overall survival ideally is really the best endpoint, but it does draw out the time and the expense of the trial, which is why I think people tend to gravitate towards an R0 resection. Christina, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And maybe just to follow up with Mark's question uh, in terms of arterial resections and your comments about, you know, institutions, what about the changing population? So what we're seeing is we're having an aging population, at least in North America. We're seeing more octogenarians than folks in the 70s. My OR list is filled with folks in the 70s rather than the 60s and 50s. Um, with locally advanced pancreas cancer, presenting with locally advanced pancreas cancer. Those are the ones that I would probably, you know, be a lot more reluctant to bring to the OR with an arterial resection. So I do think there's modality that we need um, in addition to, um, you know, even divestment may not be appropriate. So I'm wondering if you could comment and how do we, how do we move forward in that space? And the second question I have, which is related, is the definition of LAPC. And we see size doesn't matter. Um, some of it is masked by pancreatitis. And 
you know, there's a lot of masked stage four disease. And when we see these patients, and I just worry about studies like Alice's and so on, that we're going to have um, stage four disease in there and it will lead to nihilism in the end. So if you could comment on that. Yeah, no, I think those are two great questions. And I, why don't I go to the second question first? And I think this was the question that we also had yesterday uh, in the panel about the use and utility of laparoscopy prior to starting any neoadjuvant treatment. Because I think, you know, if we look back and we say, okay, well, 15 to 20% of patients have micrometastatic disease that you don't see on imaging that you take to the operating room, right? And so to be able to get those patients not on the trial to try to make the results more homogeneous, I think is a very, very important point. And it probably should be considered in the neoadjuvant trials, or I should say in the treatment trials for locally advanced pancreatic cancer. And then for the second question, I would agree with you. I think everyone is seeing older, sicker patients, which makes it much harder, right? And how do you best define who's going to be able to tolerate a big operation other than the you know, eyeball test that, you know, as you get more experience, right? And, and I get more gray hair. It's like you, you, you realize who will and will not and how do you best quantify that, you know, and what is the role of prehab, especially in these older patients? And that may be the population that benefits the most if we can optimize them. But I think it's a really, really good question because the last thing we want to do is hurt people, right? And take away their last six months. Dr. Ferroni, it's such an honor to be in the same room with you and congratulations on your new position representing us, us, our society so well. Um, so I had a couple of questions for you. One, just a comment on imaging, because I do think MRI with diffusion weighted imaging is a really good modality to augment picking up micrometa or smaller metastases that we may not see in typical CT. Um, a couple of questions, and I know this was not the topic of your talk, but resectable pancreatic cancer. I, you know, I deal with so many other tumor sites where I can guarantee a response to chemotherapy, esophagus, colorectal, et cetera. It's always amazing to me that we really are happy with the lack of a response, right? With, uh, with resectable lesion. I'd love to hear your comments on where we are with regard to that. And my second question is margin status. We, we look across the pond and you know, people are very happy with the 60 to 70% you know, margin positivity uh, rate because truly the r noughts are true r noughts. Um, is this truly a good measure? Because it's really a measure of the pathologist and your inking, correct? So I love your comments on both of those. Yeah, so I thank you for, you know, putting up that nice softball to for me to be an infomercial for the Alliance trial. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, in resectable disease, we do owe it to our patients to answer this question because uh, the chemotherapy is not like colorectal cancer, right? It, it's not as effective and it's hard to take, right? And there are plenty of patients who get onto neoadjuvant therapy and then don't make it to the operating room. And we're changing the phenotype of the tumor potentially while we're giving neoadjuvant therapy. So I do think that we owe it to our patients to, to answer this question in a systematic way. And, you know, Mark Besselink and the Dutch group uh, has taken our protocol and has replicated the protocol and are doing the exact same study in the Netherlands. So that will give us another cohort of patients to look at. But I, I would encourage all of you to please consider enrolling your upfront resectable patients so that we can answer this question. And then, um, I'm sorry, the second question was about Marge. oh, the margins. Yes, yes. And I think that with neoadjuvant therapy, it becomes harder and harder because we see more and more fibrosis. And the inking matters. The experience of your pathologist matters significantly, especially after neoadjuvant therapy. And I think we all know that from when we're taking biopsies along the arteries. And it's a lot of work for the pathologist. And if they're not experienced, they're most likely going to make a mistake in the wrong direction. And so I, I think the margin thing is, is something that uh, we all want negative margins. I think that's probably the one thing that we can all agree on. Um, but what the exact, whether it's one millimeter or just negative is the right answer. I think the across the pond, they would argue a one millimeter margin is the only thing that's a negative margin. Christina, terrific talk. 
totally agree with you that the way forward is to do clinical trials, but I, I feel like it is fundamentally flawed because the notion is one size fits all. And I think Jen Jen Ye has done a terrific work showing that yeah. there's a subset of you know, patients who won't be benefit from fulfurinox. If you could comment on the Alliance trial, because I think we shoot ourselves in the foot by having that strategy and then the trials are negative. So if you can comment on it, that would be great. Yeah, no, I, I, you're exactly right. Jen Jen Ye has done tremendous work in looking at the biology of pancreatic cancer. And yes, there definitely is a subset of patients who will not respond. I think that unfortunately that our knowledge is not mature enough to be able to make those decisions at a time or at, right now, or at least when that, you know, when, as this trial is going on. And so I'm hoping that we'll learn a lot more about this because we'll have a little bit more time, a little bit more data and a little better technology. And then we can really stratify patients correctly because I, you know, Jen Jen's work clearly shows that that's the case. Last question does Dr. Ross. Um, Christina, what an amazing talk and thank you for all the work that you do. I had a question and I, it's, it's amazing all the, the work that is done everywhere else. In my personal sphere, I've noticed in the past five years, a lot more receptible disease following neoadjuvant for locally advanced disease. But I also noticed that when I used to do them open, it was one set of outcomes. And now that I converted all the locally advanced to robotic whipples, robotic distals, uh, to an R0 resection, even though on the CT scan, it may look that there's a lot of haziness on the CT. All I do is the EUS just before to, to a biopsy the same areas, and if they're negative, I take them for resection. And sure enough, that are get R zero resection. So, is there something, or are you going to be looking eventually into what's the what's the the, the kind of operations they receive in open versus very minimally invasive, which also significantly decrease the length of stay and the outcomes. And even what we see is postoperatively, they get to adjuvant chemotherapy sooner and can tolerate more aggressive chemotherapy following robotic surgery. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Trona. And, you know, I, you're a very talented robotic surgeon. And I think that this, again, is the modality in the hands of the operator. I think there's no question that the length of stay is shorter and that the patients have less physiologic trauma. And I think, obviously, the visualization is incredible, right? Um, I think even if we stuck our head open into the wound, we wouldn't see as well as we do with the robot. Um, and, and that probably has an effect in the, or, influences how well you can get an R0 resection because you can just see better. And I've, you know, seen videos that you've made that are beautiful and one that Jin He showed yesterday. I mean, really seeing that vessel in a different way than you do when you do an open operation. So I think that will help us improve our R0 resection rate and hopefully um, improving the outcomes for our patients. Dr. Pat texted me that I need to give Dr. Froney a, a, a plaque for the statement. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. <laughs>